sin, it's in my soul. Welcome to the Salt Strong Podcast, disrupting fishing entertainment as you know it. Prepare to laugh. Prepare to get to know fishing legends in a whole new and unfiltered way. And on occasion, you might even learn a thing or two about fishing. Here's your host, Joe Simons, like diamonds. Hey guys, it's Joe Simons. If you want to catch some monster redfish and some monster speckled trout this fall, then you've got to get your hands on the brand new Mulligan Bomber. We have been working behind the scenes on this for quite some time and we've perfected it. The Mulligan Bomber has those proprietary dimples, just like a golf ball, that lets this paddle tail go farther than any other 5-inch paddle tail on the market. It also skips a whole lot better as well, enabling you to reach those fish that most people can't reach, especially those big ones. They're big for a reason. So make sure to get your hands on them. That's the 5-inch Bomber. It is the farthest casting 5-inch paddle tail we've ever seen. Comes with a little bit of scent already on it, but I would highly recommend getting some Dr. Juice as well. And you can find all of that only at fishstrong.com. So go to fishstrong.com. Insider members save 20% off everything in the store. And if you spend $50 or more, it's completely free shipping. See you over there. And here's the podcast. Hello, Salt Strong Nation. Joe Simons, Diamonds, and Luke Simons. Oh, you cut out there. What happened? I don't know. I might have blacked out. It was so good. No, I don't, it, weird. Maybe um, Zoom is now protecting my rights is uh, all this AI <laughs> stuff and people trying to copy like diamonds. Except for that one guy on uh, YouTube that does not like like diamonds for whatever reason. It's the worst thing that's ever happened to him in his life. And uh, I said, man, uh, you should be lucky. That's the worst thing that happened to you in your life, like diamonds. So we're here to talk about what all anglers, saltwater anglers in particular, should know. This is like what I wish we would have known. I wish someone had shared this ladder of importance. We're doing this on video and podcast. So if you're listening, we're going to cover this very well, but you can also go watch it. And we actually had our guy, Mike, in uh, graphic design, you know, built this just so we have an image. And what this ladder of importance is doing is putting at the top wrong what's most important. And Luke, I'm sure you agree with me. For many, many years, when we were making that transition from bass fishing to inshore saltwater fishing, we thought the most important thing was gear, right? Because that's all we heard about on TV shows. It was all sponsor driven, same as this today. And nothing against TV shows. It's how they run a business. But if you don't know, TV shows make their money from sponsors, paying sponsors to have product placement, et cetera. And same with magazines. The only way a magazine makes it because magazines don't make any money from the subscribers. It's all from the advertisers. So those were our main two ways of learning back in the day before the internet and awesome things like the Insider Club. And so because they always talked about it, we just assumed that the goal to catching more fish was all about new tackle, new rods, new reels, new line, new boats, kayaks, et cetera. And it turns out that's the exact opposite of the truth. And I know you've got a uh, whole second bedroom and we've got a whole second closet. Uh, really now it's a garage full of just stuff that we've purchased over the years in pursuit of thinking that tackle was the answer. Yeah. I basically had this completely opposite. Um, as you said, I, w- when I struggled for many years and, and when I would have a bad day, it wasn't in, in my mind, I was, I was okay. I've had a bad day. I just don't have the right equipment. So I was going out and getting nicer rods. Then I was going out and getting nicer reels. I was spending like, I was spending way more on reels th- then, like when I was, when I was just getting all my income was like picking weeds in high school, which was not fun out in the Florida sun. Uh, and and now I'm I'm spending less on reels now that I actually could afford the expensive ones that I did then because I now know that my fish catching is not based on the reel that I'm using. That's, as you can see in this chart, that's the very bottom rung. We should not be worrying about equipment, as long as it's not terrible equipment, obviously. Um, And then whenever there is a bad day, we just automatically know, okay, I had a bad day. It's not the equipment. It's going to be most likely the very top rung, which is the fishing spot. Or another thing that, again, most people overlook, I overlooked for many years, the actual positioning and approach. You know, you might... A lot of people actually pick pretty good spots and then approach the wrong direction. 
and spook everything off within two cast links. And, and that's, the, again, that's a great, uh, that's a very common example or a c- common reason why a lot of people go out and, uh, and get skunked. But, uh, but yeah, I, I can't, uh, I'd hate to even calculate how much money I wasted because I was focused on those bottom two rungs, uh, rods, reels, boats, lures, then I, and I should have been focused on just being smarter about understanding fish behavior. That's it. It's all about the fish biology and understanding why they will be in certain places at certain times of day, tide, seasons, et cetera. And if you don't get this, if you do the opposite, which we did for years, you will never become consistent. If you keep flipping these around and even the things in the middle, which we'll talk about here in a second, like your cast, you mentioned positioning and approach, you know, the right lure or bait, depending on if you're using lures or live bait, all, all those things go above the equipment, yet the equipment gets you know, all the talk, it's what all the sponsor guys, oh, I caught this with this so-and-so reel. And and we're not against that. Like Luke said, you don't want crummy stuff that's going to be freezing up and and only lasting one trip in salt water. That's not what this is about. But meaning if you're not in the right spot, positioned the right way with the right cast and right bait, your fishing game is never going to be great. It's it's going to be frustrating. It's maybe even shameful some days uh, we've all had, we've all been through that. And what's interesting is what we're about to share here. This is not just like only for our industry. I actually got this whole idea, this ladder of importance. I'll give credit where credit is due uh, from a book I was reading. And it was about, it was, it was a photography example. That was one of the main ones. And this guy who teaches photography online, similar to how we teach fishing online, he was saying like all these students come in who are trying to get really good at photography. And guess what? The first thing they want to talk about this is a rhetorical question to you, Luke. Oh, well, of the camera. I, I, <laughs> the, can, the camera. The same, the same premise. Yeah, the, the, all the equipment is in, in the camera, most important, and the tripods and all the lenses and filters and all that stuff. But he's like, everyone would come in like hungry to, oh man, which reel should I get? What which what kind of line should I get? Is it Power Pro or J Braid? Like they're asking the same sort of questions, but in the photography sense, he's like, whoa, 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 slow down. And so he built this ladder of importance and makes all of his new students kind of go through this and essentially memorize it. So it's always in the back of their head. And it turns out that the camera, just like equipment and fishing was the very least important thing at the very bottom rung of the ladder. So the top ladder, most important, the bottom, the least important. And now he's got a very thriving uh, photography school and all of his customers, students, whatever you want to call them, they all have to kind of memorize this and just keep in their head That, oh man, it's, you know what, that's not the most important thing. Let's stop talking about the lens or the the Canon versus, you know, whatever the other camera equipment, uh, big manufacturers, I don't even know. Um, It doesn't even matter. And if if you're wondering what it was in photography, uh, the number one, uh, because I have it over here, a little screenshot of the book I was reading, uh, an eye for like composition. So an eye of of knowing what to take a picture of is the most important by far. Then lighting, which makes sense for anyone who's done any sort of um, uh, of, of video work, camera work. The lighting is critical. Then storytelling through a lens. Then the post processing techniques, all the editing, Photoshop, and all that. And then it's the quality of the camera. Oh, Luke, you there? I lost Luke somehow, or I lost your picture. I heard your voice. Blink yeah. twice. Blink twice if you're in trouble. <laughs> oh, he, Otis! Uh, Otis was outside barking to come in, so he was going to keep barking until I let him in. I got you. I got you. All right. Well, we this uh, quick break sponsored by Otis. Otis Real Otis twenty five hundred. You can get it at fishstrong dot com. Which I went against everything I just said. Right? We always want to talk about the equipment. It goes back to reels. But in all yeah. seriousness, let's talk about this ladder of importance, and let's start at the top, and we'll work our way down. So number hey, well, one. Let me- let me interject just just to kind of give some I think some reasoning and yep. uh, of why this is happening and, and it's again it's not just fishing industry it's not just sorry it's across the board and it's really I, I think it's our society is so focused on consumption um, and even like you know we've been we've now been teaching fishing for for almost ten years uh, coming up in this year and, and we even see in our email open and click rates when we when we send out a really good tip on like a how to tip on how to do a, a certain thing like how to 
how to find fish at low tide or, or how to find fish. It's just something that is is the top a uh, top tier ladder on helping find the 9010 zone. Uh, those clicks don't do as good as when we do like a lure contest, which is fun, but but almost all the lure contests, as long as it's a similar color and, and depth range, is it's extremely rare when when like one lure catches a bunch of fish and another one doesn't catch any. But those are the those are what the, where the interest lays, uh, which is interesting, and and, and that's because that's not what produces results. It's all about finding the spots and. And yeah, so so we're going to make sure to to make a point of this consistently, just to make sure that that especially our members, but really anybody who's who's uh, tuned into our content, just keeps the right perspective, so that we're not uh, we're not you know not struggling on the water and, and just having more fun on the water. Yeah, and maybe the first person to tattoo this ladder of importance on their body uh, will get a thousand um, completely virtual, worthless salt trunk bonus points. Um, and it's, it's the thought that counts. And, but let's go, let's go through this. So at the top is the fishing spot where you're fishing the net, we call it the 90, 10 zone. If, if you're familiar with salt trunk, that's something that we've kind of coined and have, uh, have, uh, repeated over and over and again, cause it's so important. And, and honestly, we got that originally from, uh, Paul Johnson's book. He didn't actually call it the 90, 10 zone, but he just talked about this importance of, of finding this 10% area. Uh, where he's continually seeing 90% of the fish. We're like, oh, it's 90 tens out. And and why that's the most important, and if if you don't already know, it's because no hundred thousand dollar boat or now two hundred thousand dollar bay boat or flats boat, no nine hundred dollar dio exist reel with the brand new top of class, most expensive, slick braided line with the nicest live bait that you could possibly find in the bay. None of that matters if you're in the dead zone, right? You're it's impossible to catch fish if you're in an area where there, there are no fish. And that sounds intuitive. It makes sense, yet so many people do it, which is why they come home skunked if they hand it frustrated. So, and usually it's because we haven't put enough time and emphasis on finding that 90-10 zone. Luke, you mentioned the word trends and the biology of fish earlier. That that's it, right? Because that was one of your big aha moments. Which like, well, man, like if I just put a little bit more time in studying fish biology, I should be able to predict where they're going to be a little bit better. And it that point means I don't have to focus so much on getting the best live bait. I can maybe even catch them with a lure, and then things just started happening. So let, let's talk a little bit more in and in, uh, in your kind of your maybe your story on why this was such a big aha moment. Yeah, and, and it's it's one of those moments that it was a, a very long delayed aha moment. And I uh, just when we when we first started getting into saltwater fishing, we we finally learned some decent spots. Like Dennis Ost, um, he 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 showed us a spot where we caught our first slam. So like we we're, I just remember being so happy that we finally have a spot now where we can catch redfish, sea trout, and snook all in one day. And that like, gives it was, it was like we were like high fiving each other. And so we just went back to that same spot back to that same spot we go over and over again then we we eventually come across uh, another spot so we had by the end of like maybe two three years of of fishing pretty you know fairly frequently we had like six spots and we would do good during the summer and in the winter time we were horrible and we just got no results and i, I remember like we were like totally convinced that just the fishing wasn't good in the winter like the the fish just must like go offshore uh, we didn't know we didn't know where they went we just knew that they weren't they weren't there they weren't in the air that we were fishing and it, all we did wrong was we we learned a trend for summertime and then try in in the, in the spots they're going to be based on conditions and then we would just keep going back to those same spots and fish move right when fish are are when the water temperature changes it's um, in most cases the fish will move to from one spot to the other, and so we were continuing the summer trends when it wasn't summer. And the same thing applies even with with wind direction, right? And in many cases, the wind direction going one way is great for for summer, and then it totally flip flops for the winter. And uh, and yeah, if you don't have those trends dialed in and, and knowing exactly when they matter and when they don't and how fish, fish respond to them most importantly you're just not gonna be consistent um so so that's that's the stuff that i never even thought about about looking at the tides and the, and the wind direction uh i was looking at tides but i never thought about looking at wind direction and changing temperatures uh when i was planning trips years ago now i look at the wind direction and 
and I, I look at that before I even look at a tide chart, uh, before I even decide on any spot I'm going to fish. I love Because it's so important. It's, yep. it's incredibly important. And it's a, it's a great segue into number two. The most second most important thing is positioning and approach, right? And, and this is why guides, you know, are able to take people out to their best spots every day. I mean, think about what a full-time fishing guide does for a living. They take people, let's just say 220 days a year. There's some rainy days and cancellations, 220 days per year, approximately to their absolute best spots. And yet those spots don't get overrun with those people coming back. The spots don't get overrun and, and never are able to be fished again. And it's a lot of, it goes down to this, right? You could give someone who doesn't know how to approach and position their boat, kayak, wading boots, whatever, the best GPS spot in the world. And many times they're not going to catch fish. And, and some of it falls into the stuff below, the casting and the right lure bait. But so much happens in positioning approach. And, and where we're going with this is think about wind, right, Luke? The, depending on the wind direction and depending on on the you know the current flow and what the tides are doing completely determines how you're going to approach it. And it, so, for instance, what a lot of people do is they come in way too hot and then realize, oh, my gosh, I'm I'm going the wrong way. The wind's pushing me in here. And then they got to get their big engine back down and move back over again. They've caused so much commotion. By the time they actually wet a line, the fish are long gone if they were there to begin with. Uh, we've been on boats before, right, where the other person's driving, uh, meaning not, not us. And you watch how they approach. I mean, they're literally going right up to the mangrove line or oyster bar at full tilt before they finally slow down, almost to the point they're having to back up to stop themselves. Like, no, 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 you should have turned the big engine off way back there and we could have taken the troll motor or drifted up here based on the wind direction. So talk about why this is so critical and why we have this as a no-brainer number two. Yeah, but definitely the number two by by far, by a long shot. And, and as far as... Uh, as far as I guess my biggest realization, I, I remember I had you know, I started right out of college. I got a kayak. I'm, I moved over to uh, to Melbourne, so I was on the east coast of Florida for a while, and I started dialing in the fish there uh, over time. As I just kept kept kind of learning the the local trends over there, and I was always remember thinking, hey, like it would be so much cooler if I had a boat. I'd be catching so many more fish because I can I can go to all these different spots. Right, I can now cover the entire river, and so I finally invested the boat. Right? I saved up money and I bought my first boat. I was so happy. And so excited to get out there um, that first morning, and I, I got out. And I actually went to the, to one of the spots that I've been going to in my kayak and, and doing extremely well. This is when I was like finally starting to get to try, finally trying to figure it out. And uh, so I get out there, and I just totally, I totally flopped. I, I could not catch anything, and I was dumbfounded. I was like, I finally got this boat. I spent all this money on it, and now I'm not only am I not catching many fish, I'm doing worse than I was before with and, the kayak. And you're broke. And, <laughs> and, and I'm broke, and I have no money. And, and so what I eventually realized is, so the boat I got was a Carolina Skiff. It was, uh, it, which is, I love the boat. I still, I still love it. It was a J16. And so if you're not familiar with that, it's a boat. It's basically like a, it's like a, a kind of like a John boat. It has like a boxy look to it. Um, so it goes really shallow. And so I was going to my kayak spots in that boat because I can go anywhere. Like I could literally go anywhere, which is awesome. But the con of that style boat and many others like it is that it's it's kind of loud. There's a lot of hole slap. And so what I, what I was doing is I was positioning improperly based on the wind and that those waves, those wind waves were slapping the hull of the boat and it was literally letting every somewhat smart fish know um, within two cast ranges away that danger's in the area and they weren't eating. It was as simple as that. And so once when I finally started getting results is when I would anchor the boat at the very north end of the flat and then just walk. And that was when I was catching fish. And that's when I was really like, hey, like maybe uh, obviously the boat's scaring them. And so then I started started trying to, you know, experiment around with uh, with angling the boat certain ways, obviously approaching with the wind instead of against it. Um, but but small things like that, uh, you know, over time, over many years, I finally started getting better at, at the boat than I was at kayak. But it, but it took a lot of uh, really a lot of trial and error. And and most of all, it just took the the focus on putting the focus on positioning higher than I was before. Before I wouldn't think about it at all. And uh, and then I finally started putting it up, uh, you know, up toward the the primary list like it is here. So yeah, I, I can't uh, can't stress enough the importance of thinking about how you position and how you approach your spot because nothing's worse than actually doing the top rung right where you choose the right spot 
and then you just go there the wrong way and you you totally wreck it. Nothing worse than that. I agree. Except for number three is the cast, casting. So when we ask fishing guides and we've had, I don't know how many different pros we've had on this podcast. We're episode 500 or something crazy now. And we ask them, what's the number one mistake they see on their boats? Without a doubt, they always say casting. Of course, you know, they're already in the right spot. They're already positioned the right way. So I think they, a lot of fishing guides take the top two for granted because they're, they're really good at doing those two things. But in, it, at least in their mind, the number one mistake, once they're in that right spot and their position, right, power pull down or whatever they're doing, they're like, man, people just don't know how to cast. Even the ones who are pretty experienced anglers. And we've been out with some anglers who would call themselves pretty experienced in terms of the amount of years they've been fishing. And still the casting is lacking. And I'm not talking about just accuracy. I'm talking about accuracy and distance. And and why we have this as number three above the right lure or bait or equipment uh, and, and kind of how it fits in all this, it, if you really think about it, it just makes sense, right? You could have beautiful cast, but if you're not in a good spot, it doesn't matter. And you could have a beautiful, perfect cast, but if you're positioned 100 in 50 feet away from the thing, you'd only cast 10 feet or 100 feet, it, it's not going to be helpful either. So uh, this, after we spent a lot of time going through this lot of importance, it fit in perfect right here in, uh, in number three. And I will say just a little plug for our Insider Club, we have a thing called the Fishing School and, and full mastery courses, but Fishing School in a really short amount of time goes through every single one of these, starting at the top, right? We talk about the importance of finding that 90 10 zone and the positioning and an approach in a boat kayak or, or, or from shore based on all those variables we talked about wind, current, et cetera. And then the casting, right, Luke. And that was something you were really good at. And I don't want to say you were a natural because you practiced a lot, uh, but and it became natural where people see you cast. You're like, dude, it's like watching Beethoven play the piano. Uh, is that, is that too nice of a compliment? Yeah, that's uh, that's what Beethoven blind to or something. Yeah. Doesn't make sense at all. But uh, but what does make sense isn't is not Beethoven a piano player, a pianist? Aren't you a pianist? Pianist? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Well, the only thing that does make sense out of that was the first part when you're talking about the importance of casting and and, and yeah, and, and even like and the guides will tell you this, but even when I take people out, uh I within the first three minutes, I almost always am correct on who's going to catch the most fish. And it's just looking at their cast, you know, can not, not their form per se, but, but can they deliver either the live bait or the lure? Because this isn't just for lures as casting is incredibly important for live bait and even cut bait too. If you're fishing mangroves, for example, and it's a hot summer day and the fish are up in the shade and, and you can't get that bait right next to the mangroves or even, even better if you can get it up underneath if you can't get in under that shade or at least close to it, you're not going to catch anything. Even with the best live bait possible, even with a eight hundred dollar reel that like Joe has to use to to actually catch fish. True, but um, but the cast is crucial, and, and knowing not, not just the cast, right? Not just how to cast. That get, everybody knows how to cast, but but know how how to adjust your cast based on the conditions, right? Do you need do you need a skip cast? Do you need a, a sidearm? Um, to to deliver that lure or that bait up underneath a dock or or trees, or are you doing max max distance where you need to hit a pothole a long ways out, or you're casting to a tailing red, right? There's a lot of different scenarios, and, and if you if you don't if you don't have the skills to deliver your whatever bait or lure you're using to the target, you're not going to catch fish, and uh, and, and so cast. Uh, the cast is crucial. And again, that's something that I never even thought about. Like I never like purposely practiced casting um, until, until more recently. And that's a big reason why I struggled for many years. Yep. And and you and I get to fish, you know, pretty often. And there's times when I take a break just, you know, with kids and, and summer where we're not going out fishing and uh, and sometimes I come back kind of rusty and you could tell like, wow, man, Joe's not going to catch as many fish. And there's other times, remember, I was practicing in the backyard almost daily with the kids. I was practicing casting in a bucket. We had a little trampoline. I was trying to cast right into the little door opening. And I'd come back with you. And you're like, holy smokes, dude, where, what have you been doing? And like you can actually see it at, to your point almost immediately. Like, you know, all right, we're going to have an epic day. And the guides say the same thing. So casting is critical. And if you guys like my analogy, Luke, make sure in the comments to put, there goes Luke tickling those ivories. Uh, old Beethoven. Uh, Got to have a little fun with you, buddy. Uh, next one is the right lure or bait. As Luke said, this is not 
about saying, oh, you only need to use lures, only libate. It doesn't matter. You know, if you're in the right spot, we personally like lures, as you probably know. Uh, I love the control, the freedom of it, not having to worry about, you know, keeping bait alive and going out and getting it and carrying on the cast net and all the cleanup. And I don't know, to me, it's it's just a lot. There's a time and a place for it. But it fits in here well, because think about it, if it was above your cast, right? You had all the best stuff, but you couldn't even get it out there. It's not going to do you much good. So picking that right lure or bait is number four in terms of what's most important. And I'm, I'm, you might think differently. I don't think you do, but my big aha moment with this was to keep it simple. And I know there's going to be someone who's going to poo-poo and say, well, you guys used to say keep it simple, but now you have all this stuff. We still keep it simple. If you fish with me, I'm going to have usually a slam shady paddle tail, either the old 2.0 or the or the mulligan, and maybe a prawn, maybe a tweaker, and that's it. Um, now, occasionally, top water, and of course, now I'm going against everything I just said. But I'm keeping it simple compared to a lot of people that have these massive backpacks. They have to bring a, a forklift to get on the boat of all this stuff, or like the bass guys that have 12 rods rigged up with every possible thing you could possibly imagine. In general, keep it pretty simple. Never more than like five total lures. And what I'm going fishing with, Right on a day-to-day -day basis, it's usually just two. Uh, so even if it is a day like in, in the fall where I might use a skinny lipper to start and the rest of the day, it'll be using one thing. Like, all right, I'm only going to throw the slam shitty mulligan, which is what we did like last Tuesday or I guess last Friday we fished. I caught I caught redfish um, just using that one thing over and over and over again. What are your thoughts? Yeah, just not as big as the redfish I caught that day. But... Oh, tickle out, Reeves, it's because he can cast so well. He's just tickling <laughs> No, but I but there I did I, I was using a bigger lure, so we we have um, I was using the new Mulligan five inch, and so the the bigger lures usually catch the bigger fish. But and so again, small things like that you know can make a difference. But on this ladder, right, this these last two are are by far not even close to the top three. It is if like this this ladder is not drawn to scale. Um, so so yeah, before we like before we, I'll, I'll talk uh, kind of my lure my lure strategy, but. Don't even worry so much about that until these top three are are, are really focused on. So, yeah, as for lures, like Joe said, I I do carry a lot, but I when I when I plan the trip, I rarely go away from the plan. I usually just bring two rods, and I rarely ever change my lures. So I start depending on what's happening, but I'll, I'll always have a top water, the the uh, skinny lipper, the prawns of both sizes. I have paddle tails of three different sizes. Um, and, and, but I, I only have one color of each. Like I rarely ever change colors when I'm out of the water, just because you don't really need to most of the time. Uh, I've done a lot of, a lot of lure contests and yes, the colors do make a difference in some instances. It's just so rare that it's probably not worth spending a lot of time on and not much money on, but it's fun to use different colors. So we, we offer a lot of colors. It's fun. It's fun to test things out. Because there's, there are going to be situations where color does matter. And for those like really advanced anglers that want to like really pinpoint and, and get super precise, they're awesome. But if you're a beginner, like just get one, just get one color of each thing and keep it simple. So like I use Slam Shady across the board for anything that's bait fish imitation. And then uh, for the shrimp, I use Natural. And the tweaker, I like Turd Ferguson because it's a funny name and it, and it, and it works. Funny name. And that's it. Like those are, those are that's like that's my list and then for the moonwalker right it's a bait fish so i use slam shady skinny lipper bait fish slam shady color and uh and just keep it simple and my catch rate has skyrocketed once i did that i used to have literally a whole a whole bag full of soft plastics i would have every single color of every model that i use and then i would have like another section of, of lures that i haven't used yet and again multiple colors and I'll, I'll get lost in the confusion. And that's another reason why I really do not like those speed clips, because to me, that emphasizes what people should not be doing, which is just changing lures over and over and over again. Um, that That's if you're not catching fish, it's usually because of one of the top three, not the bottom, not the bottom two. Yeah. Unless you just have a bad lure or bad equipment, right? You can't you can't escape something just bad. But as long as you have good, you know, good stuff in those bottom two categories, uh, you don't need to worry about them very yeah. much. And 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 there's there's going to be a different story or scenario for every angler, right? And I'm talking about like a, having a confidence lure or even a confidence live bait. 
And, and and that is why I do buy a lot of stuff. You still buy a lot of stuff because we're always testing it, but I'm always looking at it like versus what I know works. Right. And it was like, man, if I can't, if I don't feel this, I'm just not going to use it again. I'll give it away. give it to my kids or whatever, or, or just sit there. Um, so I, to me, it's finding that confidence bait or lure and, and just owning that thing. And, and that's what most of the pros do too. Even the most, the bass pros on, on the, on the freshwater side, if you talk to them, most of them, they all have that confidence lure that like, this is, if I could only use one, or if I'm only going to be able to start with one, which is obviously I can only start with one. Uh, it's usually the same thing over and over and over again. Um, and as Luke said, a lot of these colors and stuff, they do matter for the advanced people. If you're in a tournament, yeah, like you want to have everything in your arsenal ready. But in general, just trying to get tight lines, focus on the first three, and then these other ones just kind of fall into place. So we'll talk about the last one, which is just the overall equipment. So the the rod, the reel, which gets a lots of attention, having a boat, as Luke talked about, or a kayak, or the latest and greatest wading boots, or braided line, or whatever it is. Certainly great to talk about. We'll probably still be talking about it in five years from now on uh, on this podcast. Um, it, that part will never go away because it is fun, right? It is fun to talk about equipment, to be a gearhead. I completely get it. But if if it's because you're not talking about these other ones that you only get to talk about this, I, I do think that's one of the biggest mistakes that, that people make. And I, I would love to to see more email opens on some of those how-to tips, right? Like how to find the 9010 zone uh, on a super windy day or after a big hurricane or a storm. Those things are so much more important than, hey, how did this lip, uh, whatever we're calling it, the, the big lipper do versus the skinny lipper. Is the big lipper, what's it called? Fat lipper, fat, the fat lipper. Yeah, it's a great name. Uh, the fat lipper is a new lure guy versus the skinny lipper. Uh, yeah, cool to watch those videos. I love watching them myself, but man, I, I, I really do wish we'd come up with this earlier. We've, we've talked about this stuff, but never had it like in a visual like this on this uh, ladder of uh, importance. So I hope this was uh, helpful. I hope this is memorable. And uh, as I said, we'll, we'll, we'll be printing this off and putting in the insider club. I'm sure we'll put it inside of that uh, that fishing school. If you haven't gone through that, it is a no-brainer. It is all of this on steroids, you know, on on camera, on the water, showing how to do all of this stuff. If you just went through that alone, it's free to all members. The fishing school, but only members is not. It's not public. Uh, you will, you know, your confidence will skyrocket. You will know more than ninety eight percent of all the other inshore anglers out there just trying to figure it out. Yeah, and it, and it talks to you at your level as well. So there's there's a beginner, intermediate, and invent, advanced modules. Which you know, just just but if you're a beginner, it, it's a mistake to try to go too far too fast. Yep. So we just teach you everything as far as the gear, right? The gear. Hey, you might not even like fishing, so let, like don't overspend. So we give you the the lowest priced gear that can get good results, and then it just progressively gets more and more uh, more and more detailed. Same thing for fishing spots, right? You like you don't need. To be uh, to be utilizing like every single feature in smart in the smart fishing spots, there are a bunch of them. And for a beginner, hey, just do just do these these couple things, and you're gonna be catching fish. And then for the advanced anglers, then it starts going into the fish behavior based on season and and applying the wind and and the current flow. It really goes down to that to the next level to catch really the bigger fish. Um, whereas the beginner, hey, let's just go out and catch some fish. So um, so that way, like you will not be lost in this uh, in this. This course, you can start, stop whenever you need to. And on any of them, if, if you have questions too, we're here to help. So just every single every single lesson has has a section for, uh, for Q&A. So just post your questions and we'll get back to you usually within uh, 24 hours. Yep. So if you're already a member, go check that out. It's right there. You can find it in the community. If you're not a member, what the heck are you waiting on? So I'm going to take you by the hand and help you uh, find the fish every week and save tons of money in your tackle because that is what we do. So even if you don't have a trip coming up anytime soon, you still need to join. There is so much you can do and learn and discover from the comfort of your home. And uh, like the photography uh, company that is teaching online photography, our friend Justin had a massive before it was sold a, a massive online a golf, uh, on, you know, f uh, school essentially, and uh, now it's even bigger. It's owned by the Golf Channel, and it's massive. Uh, so many of these things and little techniques, and even the rigging and the 
you know, finding the 9010 zone through smart fishing spots can all be done from your house. You don't even have to be on the water so that when you do get that chance to go out in the water, that valuable time or that hall pass, that you are armed, dangerous, confident, and you have a plan in place. You know exactly where to go. So come join us. That's all over at saltstrong.com. As Luke said, once you're in, you can ask as many questions as you want. Coaches are in there. Just an amazing, tight-knit community that's super helpful as well. Yeah, I want to throw one more thing into. I'll just just show just like a, a a graduation, if you will, from that fishing school. This was a picture taken this morning. I was testing a, a new uh, a new go off that we're um, they're putting together. But this this is a twenty four and a half inch trout that I caught with a loud dog on the boat. This is my dog Otis, who I I had to take a quick uh, leave of absence for. Um, but I was in a twenty four foot bay boat. Right, fishing shallow water and catching a uh, catching a big trout. Something I never thought would be possible for a big trout on a lure from a, a big boat. But the exact spot that I caught this is actually featured in the fishing school, coincidentally. Um, and it talks about again, it talks about I, I just used the positioning, um, the positioning strategy that was uh, that was discussed in there in an exact spot that was shown in there. And then obviously I was using the type of lure based on the conditions that, that got success. So the, the, this is not, this stuff is not rocket science, right? Fish are not, they're not smart. Uh, they're also not dumb, but, uh, but as long as you just learn the basics and, and go through uh, a, a structured, uh, a structured sequence like that fishing school is the most efficient, uh, efficient trans, you know, transitional or transformational process I've ever, I've ever seen. So yeah, just just utilize that, and and you will be shocked on on how good of a fisherman you can be. Where you do not have to be doing this your whole life. Uh, just know know the actual strategies, and you can go from never catching a trout ever before to catching big ones consistently. Because they're again, it's not rocket science. Yep. And remember the ladder. Tattoo it on your body. Not really. That, that is not great advice. Uh, listen to my friend here, Amadeus. Uh, come and rock me, Amadeus. I think we need to like move, like take a rung out in between the top three and the bottom two, because like those just to to graphically show the uh, the importance difference. Because there is a very big gap between those. My opinion. Well, yeah, but then someone could trip and fall, and then there's lawsuits from the ladder. So it's, not, it's just not where it is. <laughs> Appreciate you guys. We'll talk to you on the next episode. Make sure to go in the community. Put your post in there. If you haven't seen, we have all these waypoints and a catch log as well for members. So it used to be that the community was just a place to kind of share your fish picks. Now in the community, it's building a private catch log for you. So you can go to your little waypoints. Only you get to see these, by the way. And it's now going to show you on the map and it'll show you like Luke's trout he just caught today. It'll show him exactly what the tide was, what the moon phase was, exactly where he caught it on the tide cycle, water or air temperature, all that stuff is being captured, building up essentially like a trend analyzer for you. And the more you have in there, obviously the better it's gonna get in helping predict when you're gonna have the best bite of your life. So make sure to be using that. It's all very, very cool in that waypoint section and it can all be done through the community as well. Anything else, Luke? That covers it. I just, I just wish I would have uh, been taught this, you know, 20 years ago. We would have saved many thousands of dollars on uh, equipment that I didn't need and a lot of gas money that I didn't need to be burning. Amen. Amen. All right, guys, we appreciate you, and we'll talk to you on the next episode. Peace. See ya. Cause fish in, it's in my soul. It was passed down to me from the day. On the water, if there was a way, it's been a